Boa tarde a todos e todas, bem-vindos a mais uma Labo Lecture, bastante especial hoje. Uh, uma Labo Lecture só de mulheres, no caso, não é mesmo? Agora que, que, que reparei que gostamos desse formato mesmo, né? Me digam se estão todos nos vendo, se está clara a, a, o som e a imagem, já já a Hilária vai falar, já está aqui conosco, mas... Eu gostaria muito, muito de agradecer uh, uh, quem está fazendo essa live comigo, uh, Flavinha Sarinho. Eu vou falar, ela vai ficar com vergonha, mas eu vou falar porque aqui é assim, a gente constrange as pessoas ao vivo, não é mesmo? Perfeito, Denise, muito obrigada, muito obrigada, Leandro, obrigada por vocês já estarem aqui. Flavinha é pesquisadora do Núcleo de Estudos Agostinianos, pesquisadora do Grupo de Pesquisa de Ana Arendt, recentemente, pesquisou durante muitos anos com o professor Eduardo Wolff sobre filosofia antiga, Carol Padovani já está gritando Flavinha, uh, olá Vilma, olá Gustavo, olá Ju, olá Cris, olá todo mundo aqui. E, uh, além disso, é a grande conselheira editorial do nosso Aflates, e o que a gente pode dizer Uh, é a CEO do Labo, pra, do Labo praticamente, não é mesmo? Vamos então, depois da apresentação da Flavinha, a Flavinha vai apresentar a Hilária, mas vamos lá, Hilária vai falar, nossa querida, nossa best friend já, durante 20 a 30 minutos, e depois abrimos para as questões. Eu vou só pedir uma coisa para vocês, gente, fiquem à vontade para escrever as questões ou em português ou em inglês, mas se forem escrever em português, Perguntas curtas, para a gente ter tempo de traduzir ou traduzir simultaneamente e para ter tempo de resposta, tá bom? E Gustavo, vou passar a palavra para a Flavinha falando uma frase de Gustavo Augusto da Silva que fala o que seriam os agostinianos sem a Flávia? Flávia, é com você, meu bem. Lembrando sempre de abrir o microfone, que é super fundamental, né? Sim. Boa tarde é, a todos. Jamais pensei que fosse dizer isso. Estou ouvindo a Andréia falar boa tarde a todos faz um ano e agora me convidou, para não dizer que me coagiu, ela me convidou para estar aqui, muito obrigada. Bom, mas aqui não é sobre mim, é sobre a Hilária. Então, a Hilária é filósofa, escritora, doutora pela Universidade de Paris, Sorbonne, colabora com várias revistas e ministra cursos de escrita criativa. Ela escreveu esse livro, Lições de Felicidade, que, lançada no Brasil pela editora Aimê, e ela vai falar com a gente de 20 a 30 minutos sobre o livro, e depois a gente vai ter um espaço, então, para perguntas. Então, so, eu vou agora passar para inglês. Hilaria, now it's with you. Thank you very much for being here. We are delighted to have you here. It's me, I'm delighted and uh, thank you so much. And I'm so glad that I think I understood you uh, both, Andrea and Flavia. Great! I, make, yes, be, because in some way, uh, Italian and Portuguese like, look a, a little bit alike. So uh, even though uh, in Portuguese, I, I think I can say uh, with the wrong uh, pronunciation, Uh, uh, only uh, boa tarde and uh, muito obrigada. <laughs> it's fantastic. It's fantastic and it's enough. It, it's great. <laughs> anyway, I, I think uh, I understood you and I'm so happy about it. And I'm so, so glad to be here with you. Um, really, it, for me, it's a great honor. I'm very humbled and honored to be here with you. Uh, because I was so happy when I uh, first uh, knew that my uh, my book was coming uh, was being published in Portuguese, and I was so excited. And it was just just a few months before the pandemics, and so I was thinking, oh, that's so cool! I will go maybe on a tour to Brazil, which is a country I always dreamt of visiting and and then I well uh, all the stuff that we know happened and so I couldn't come but hopefully one day I will and and for now you know it's just so so big this thing to be there just virtually it's you know it's really heartwarming and I'm very very happy about it and um, 
Anyway, I'm also happy to do something because for me here in Italy, it's 10 o'clock p.m. And uh, as I was telling Andrea and Flavia, that's so, you know, like uh, a foolish evening for me because here we have uh, the curfew. I know you, you, you have to a curfew. And so I haven't done anything uh, after 7, 8 p.m ever in a few months so it's so so cool i'm very happy to be here anyway uh, i was uh, the reason why uh, you invited me is uh, to give a little speech uh, uh, i wouldn't say a lecture but a speech about my book uh, which in italian is that's the italian edition let's uh, di felicità and uh, lisa is the felicidade <laughs> The, the title is the same, but it's just the Italian and the, uh, and the um, Portuguese uh, Brazilian version. version. And anyway, uh, what I uh, was uh, willing to tell you is just a little bit the how I came to write this book, because it's a kind of a weird idea, kind of a crazy experiment that I did with myself, because um, actually I studied philosophy. Uh, first of all, I studied in uh, uh, Scuola Normale Superiore in Pisa, which is uh, a university uh, that was founded by Napoleon in uh, the beginning of the 19th century. And uh, uh, there's, a, there's two Ecole Normale uh, in France and one in Italy because uh, you know, Napoleon was there and he founded this school. Uh, I studied there and I studied, um, my, my thesis was uh, about Spinoza. So I studied the uh, Pantheism and Spinoza especially. And afterwards, I, may, I did my PhD in Paris uh, at uh, uh, La Sorbonne. And I was still studying uh, Spinoza and, and Pascal also. And I was studying uh, some theories of emotions in the 16th century. And so I lived for a few years in Paris. And while I was living there, I wrote my first novel, uh, which is like a college novel, um, a, a genre uh, which is not very popular in Italy. It's more of a Anglo-Saxon Saxon, uh, genre because in Italy we don't have many colleges for university. I don't know about Brazil, but in Italy it's very usual that when you go to university you live either with your parents or in a flat with a flatmate. Colleges are very rare. And since I lived in a college, I decided to write a college novel, which is kind of a mystery story set in a college. And then afterwards, I published this novel and then I became kind of a writer. I started going to festivals and all this stuff. And my life like fell apart. I lost my love story. I was very crazy about what to do because I had studied philosophy. I think uh, many of you have, uh, are familiar with this feeling that you study philosophy and then you say, you tell yourself, what am I going to do? after I studied philo philosophy, because it's not easy, it's not obvious to have a career. Uh, yes, you can have an academic career, but it's not that obvious. And, and so I was just wondering what to do with my degree, with my PhD and all the stuff. And I was like feeling that my life was coming, was really falling apart. And then I had to move because I had to change my flat. I couldn't live in my flat anymore, as I tell in the in the book. If some someone has read the book, uh, that is true. I was, you know, I found myself just packing my stuff because I had to move. And as I was moving, I, you know, I noticed that I had so many ancient philosophy books. I had really collected and bought, and bought through the years many, many books. Uh, when I was living in Italy, when I was living in Paris, I bought so many books. And I just told myself, you know, this Greek philosophy is like filled with wisdom. And why, why don't I give a chance to this ancient wisdom to tell me what to do now? Just not tell me what to do now in the way that you, you know, you ask somebody to give you advice, but in some way that could move my mind to find its own path. 
And I was, you know, amazed because I collected all these books, I read these books, and I never thought about, uh, you know, asking questions to these books. I never thought about uh, speaking philosophy as a living language, you know? By now I'm speaking my very bad English, so I'm sorry, I hope you understand. Everybody understands you, don't worry, that's perfect. <laughs> because I haven't spoken English in a long, long time. But when I learned English, it was when I was 16, I was sent by my parents. I, I, I made, um, there was a concourse at, at school and I won it. And I was sent to Australia for three months, like 16 year old, you know, you go to Australia three months, you know, you, you learn it. <laughs> and I learned not so well, but enough to communicate. And at school in Italy, uh, we have this kind of school, which is, I think it's very precious. And um, it's a school where you study ancient Greek and, and, and Latin. And I did this school. And there's a lot of polemics about this school because you study Greek and Latin only to translate, you know, to translate uh, ancient text. Uh, and that is very interesting, but it is true that when you study these all languages, only to do translations, so you have your dictionary and you have to look for the words and then to write word, and you are very afraid to make mistakes because it's very important that you have a, a good note about your uh, Italian translation of this ancient text. And that is very different from learning a language in order to communicate, in order to speak it. And this comparison came to my mind as I was like moving my books and I found these uh, ancient philosophy books. I told myself that it's so true that I studied philosophy in the same way as I studied uh, ancient Greek and Latin at school, you know, just to do my homework, just to do my version, just to do, uh, to answer correctly to the teacher when he asks questions, she asks questions about what I have studied, but not to communicate, not to live within this language. And I was imagining that philosophy could be in some way, imagined like a language that could either learn for communication, you know, to live in it, to use it for your everyday life, uh, which is not, you know, something degrading everyday life. It's something very important because it is your life, your secret life develops in your everyday life. Your dream life develops in your everyday life. Everything develops in your everyday life. And so I asked myself, why am I saving this for what? And then I remembered an essay by Montaigne, which is an author that I absolutely love, uh, where he says about education, he, sa he says, uh, you know, like pupils learn things and they think they are going to use them and maybe they will never use them. And I was never using them. So I was like lost in my life and I didn't know what to do with all this doctrine that I had learned and I had in my head. And so one book I came across during this, uh, this uh, moment of, you know, of craziness was uh, uh, a book by uh, Pierre Hadot, uh, which is a French uh, philosopher and scholar. Um, the book is called uh, Exercice Spirituel et Philosophie Antique, uh, which means um, spiritual exercises and ancient philosophy. And um, I don't know how it is translating into English or into Portuguese, but it's a book from the end of the 70s and he was studying uh, the ancient Greek schools and he found out as he, he, he formed himself in a Foucaultian area, so he was very careful to, you know, way of living and discipline uh, of the life and stuff like that. And he found out uh, that he could study the schools like the Epicurean school, uh, the uh, sex capital school, the Stoy school, and, and also uh, the Lyceum and the Academy from um, uh, Plato and Aristotle, so also the big schools in ancient Greek, in ancient Greeks, uh, Greece, um, like some places where people were not supposed only to learn philosophy, but 
also to live philosophy. So like to conduct their life in some ways that were uh, learned from uh, their teachers, uh, to conduct their lives like an, a spiritual exercise. You know, when you start thinking about what you do and you kind of educate yourself to do it in a, a more conscious way. And so that was kind of, you know, when you have this click that tells you that you are on the way to something. And I asked myself, why can, can, can't I try, you know, to put myself at these schools? Because it is true that these schools were kind of communities it was not something that you did on your own. You were in a community of people that were doing this, just walking the, the same path. But I told myself, it is true, I'm alone. It was one of the, the moments of, you know, the, more, uh, the most lonely moments in my life. So it was very, very lonely. But anyway, I was uh, like very willing to find myself and not to find myself in a new age kind of way, but in the way, in an ancient Greek way, you know, in the way of the Gnosi Seuton, uh, which means like know yourself, know your real self. Just, I was very willing to try to understand why I was, you know, going away in this, in this sea of impossibilities um, of, you know, of nothing that was drifting in. And so I, uh, and so I, I said to myself, okay, I will do an experience. I will like be like a scientist and uh, my material for this experiment will be myself because I will need all my thoughts or my dreams and anything. And uh, I just tried to make myself do it. And, uh, and so I did for six weeks, um, every week, actually in the book, it, it is uh, six weeks, weeks of my life are featured, but uh, it was more than six weeks because it was one week of studying, one week of living and taking notes about everything. So I started like with the Pythagoric school and then uh, I studied for a week and then I lived for a week, like every day and I was keeping a diary I had this very full diary filled with anything uh, about what I was doing, what I was thinking, what I was eating also, what I was dreaming, what I was feeling. And then from the diary, I, I wrote the book like week by week. And there were six weeks and in every week I learned something. Uh, I chose the minor schools. I didn't uh, feature the major school. Uh, I think you, if someone has uh, read the book, you've noticed, you, you will notice that there's no Aristoteles, there's no Plato, they're like missing from my book, because I wanted to be, you know, with a more open minded about them, I, I wanted to know a little less, because these schools, uh, at least as I studied them at university, are li like a little less studied, and so you know a little less about them. So I wanted to discover and put myself at proof with it. And what I found, uh, well, what I found is uh, something maybe we, we should uh, talk later about that, but um, the thing that just mostly changed my vision about ancient philosophy, about philosophy itself, also is that, uh, well, maybe it is good to uh, regain that look about philosophy that was long lost, I think, because, you know, there's all this self-help uh, uh, tendency that is very much motivational, uh, very much about, you know, like what you should do, you should believe in yourself, but it's uh, very unproblematic. Uh, and meanwhile, there's, it's much more interesting uh, to, you know, to find out that, Yes, there is this uh, self-help tendency that has its dignity, I, I don't question that, but that's not what uh, I'm interested in. What I'm interested in is uh, much more the tradition of philosophy as uh, something that can um, in some way cure, take care of, the, of what makes you suffer. And let's 
a very ancient tradition and we were talking about Augustine before and that's important for him as well but also that's, that's something like very very ancient also uh, Seneca and there are many many philosophers that use philosophy as you know a way to cure your soul and that's I think very very deep and that's something we miss a little bit in our society nowadays and uh, it is linked to this uh, idea of philosophy as some as some way of a cure about what makes uh, us suffer is the idea that the ancient greeks had and that we have lost i'm sorry i speak about uh, the society in italy but i think it's kind of a global thing uh, we live in a society that is very very much obsessed with happiness but uh, which conceives happiness as something that is very momentarily and something that like can get, go away every moment it's like a, a cloudless sky which you know at the first cloud that appears <laughs> it's already ruined and uh, that's the idea of happiness as you know somehow uh, uh, getting, you know, somehow forgetting that uh, you have uh, your um, something that worries you, that you have to know the pain of existence, that existing means knowing the pain of existing. And that's a very naive idea of uh, happiness. And it's an idea that is based on the denial of what is dark, what is obscure, what is troubled in the in our everyday existence. And the Greeks, on the other hand, they had a much more inclusive, much, much com more complete idea of happiness, because to them, happiness was uh, much more similar to a path to uh, a way you have to find yourself and to explore on your own in your life. And that was based on your knowledge of yourself, which is something very, very hard and very, very troubled. And which is something that does not, is not in contradiction with, uh, you know, your dark moments, you know, with the dark knowledge of something that is not good for you, of what makes you suffer of the pain of existing and so i think that, that was very very interesting and very deep to you you know to try to bring it back in my in my simple and and very you know very trivial life of a, a 21st uh, century woman which was you know living a, a love breakup uh, which uh, had to move from a, a city that she loved you know there were very simple problems my problems but you know some problems that are in some kind um, in some way universal that you know every Every one of us finds himself like losing his points of view, uh, losing you know all the references in, in their lives. Uh, it is very common to be lost at some time in your life. So I was like feeling that the pain I was experiencing was like a very common pain. It was not special, and so I could try to look at my own pain in you know from a from a perspective and that perspective was the perspective of someone who was feeling the urge to find her own path which was the path of happiness according to the greeks because for the greeks you know happiness is a virtue it's not like something that you can you know gift yourself with it's not something that you want because you are very selfish because you are not good it's not anything that has to do with shame or pity although we link it a little bit because we have a very consumistic idea of happiness i think so we think happiness is you know something more something that we add to our lives and for the greeks instead it is something that has to do with your virtues 
as a man, as a human being, they say a man because they're a bit uh, machist, but that's another problem <laughs> with exceptions like Epicure that I love for that. But anyway, we'll, think, uh, we'll talk maybe about that later. But anyway, that was so revolutionary to me. The idea that happiness could be, you know, something necessary, something that had to do with the vocation of the human beings and, you know, with that status in life, like being alive with a conscience, which is, you know, something that is a little bit um, peculiar and something that leads us to a lot of unhappiness as well, but which can be, you know, the trigger to finding their or happiness. Happiness that, that is not like a simple, you know, well-being thing, but something much more deep and linked to the, um, you know, to the, to the task of finding its own way to building their own destiny in a way that looks like what they really are, their real nature. And uh, about that, which uh, I think that was very important to me was the, um, the speech that uh, Socrates delivers in the Apology of Socrates, uh, you know, that was written by Plato. So we don't really know we were not there, but that's very, very important because Socrates is like uh, at the, in, the, in the court and has been judged by the, his citizen. They're very angry with him because they think they're, he, that he is spoiling the youths and it's, you know, it, it, it is an uh, unreligious man, it's giving, you know, it's ruining everything. And so he just is there and is much more intelligent than the people that uh, like uh, um, plant sues against him. And so he could, you know, just maybe he could like be a, a little smart and do a trick and they they will say okay okay just apologize and we're fine but it doesn't and what it does is delivering a speech about daimon which is an entity which is very unclear to this day so it is something very problematic something very deep and he says okay you can you know you can do whatever you can uh, uh, condemn me to death, which is what they do, and but you can do whatever you want, but I have nothing to be uh, to apologize for because I just always followed my diamond. I never went against my diamond. And they said, what, what's this diamond? It's like a voice that prevents him from doing something that betrays its own, his own nature. And he says, I've been hearing this voice since I was a kid. And every time I was doing something that was not like me, this voice was, you know, in some way, it was trying to put itself in the middle to stop me from doing that. And what is very interesting is that the word, one of the Greek words for uh, to say uh, happiness is eudaimonia, which means have a diamond, which is like good, which is feeling good, which means that you are behaving in a way that your own inner voice wouldn't tell you that you are going in the wrong direction. So this is, I think, a very good definition of happiness for the Greeks. The definition of a condition where you are leading your way through the life, to, through your life, in some way that your inner voice that, you know, that is very alarmed anytime that you betray yourself is like very quiet because you are behaving as you should behave according not to an outside moral or something like that, but according to what you really, really are. So I think this is some something very, very deep, very, uh, very difficult also. And but to do this, uh, I think it is very good, very useful uh, to you know try oneself, oneself to to test your limits. And that was exactly what I tried to do uh, on my own, which is like very, very little. And uh, somehow also in a 
humorous way because uh, I think it is uh, the use of the irony is very useful in this uh, in these uh, things because you know when you are um, talking to yourself you're working on about yourself and it's very easy to be involved in some selfish uh, uh, tours uh, about oneself and then you you lose uh, anything uh, in contact with the outside world. Um, while I thought I, I, I should, you know, keep a distance through humor, to, through irony, and yet try myself, like, just try to, uh, you know, take my habits, take my uh, everyday life, take my thoughts also, and try to fold them in another way, following the teachings of these very ancient teachers and that was the best part of it because uh, I studied all the lives and the teachings of these ancient teachers I studied the fragments and the testimonies and everything like that and I found like a way to get to know them uh, at least to me they were very alive and I was feeling like they were you know in some way leading me through this uh, crazy life experiment that I, I led. And so I wrote the book in this very uh, happy condition. Um, although it was not the best uh, moment of my life, it was a, a quite of a harsh moment and I was a little bit lost. But, you know, I took my my feeling of my limits on of my imperfection of my fails of my faults and i took it all and i wrapped it into this you know greater feeling of being somewhere somewhere somehow alike to these women and men that had lived like so many years before me um, mostly men, of course, maybe we we'll talk about that. But anyway, it was a feeling that, you know, of belonging to a uh, idea of mankind that was so heartwarming because it, uh, you know, it humbled myself and it, it taught me that, you know, that the questions that we ask ourselves are somehow the same through the centuries, through the, you know, any age and any anywhere and i felt somehow that it was uh, a consolation to me it was something that was soothing my sorrows and it was also something that proved to me that you know i was not forced to be to have the the limits that I thought I had. I mean, uh, every one of us has limits. We are human and as, as such, we have limits. But, you know, some, sometimes we, I think we imprison ourselves uh, into the words that we use to describe our own way of being. And we can, uh, you know, we can challenge that. And I was like, uh, discovering the extent to which uh, our willpower can uh, can do that uh, and our thinking power can do that um, and so that was very very funny but very instructive uh, as well um, and nothing uh, I think uh, I, 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 I talked so, even too much but uh, anyway that was my book and that was quite weird because I wrote it um, in um, um, two years and a half ago. And then it, ca it came out in the spring of uh, 19. And and so I just started uh, going on tour with it. It, it was um, it, it was good in Italy. The, it was welcome, a, a welcomed book because I think many people like uh, needed to, you know, to talk about it to, and to think about these, uh, these topics because it's something that touches everybody. And then one year after it appeared, uh, the pandemic started and unluckily and, you know, that was a tragedy. And which what was very weird was that in some way, everybody was forced to change their habits and do something in some little way similar to that, but especially to ask themselves some questions that these Greeks in some way answered. 
many of these schools were born in a crisis period, you know, the Hellenistic period, like uh, Epicure, but also the Stoicism, they, they speak to people that are, are living a, a crisis, no? a great changing in the world because there's Alexander the Great and, and every, the bonds of the world are just changing and the geography of the world is changing and you know they're losing anything, they're losing their religion in some way we can say. And that's so weird that these philosophers were asking to, were um, answering to people that had fears that had fear to lose themselves and that was were very frightened and that they were doubting about their status in the world. And what do they say? They say, you should not uh, lead, let your, your fears, you know, um, play you. They're not kidnapping parts of you so you, that you have to pay a ransom to them. You are free you're free to answer to your fears as well. And I think that is a very powerful answer also to the fears that we have now and that is human to have now. I'm finished. <laughs> I don't know. Perfect. Perfect. No, we could have listened to you for more time. Don't worry <laughs> about it. Uh, first of all, Ilaria, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, I have two things to say before we start to the questions. First of all, you said that just some people read your book, but here in Brazil and here at our lab, many people have read and many people that are here. Yeah, many people that are here with us, the audience and asking questions and telling how much they liked your book. So it's not the minority, it's the majority, you know, because then I, I have a second point, because I think we have a gap, as you've already said, between uh, self-help books, linking them with philosophy and everything. We have this whole coach mentality here in Brazil and all around the world that it's just, uh, I, I don't have any word, I don't have so many words to talk about them. Disgusting. <laughs> Disgusting, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, to really read something that is really as powerful and deep as your book, with irony, as you said, with humor, but uh, helping us to deal with the problems of our lives, it's a blessing. So it's that. Let's go. Pessoal, a gente... Yeah, you're welcome. Pessoal, a gente vai fazer algumas perguntas que vieram dos grupos de pesquisa. Voltamos às perguntas da, de vocês. Então, a gente vai tentar fazer um mix aqui. Flávia, please. Ok. So, Ilaria, while reading your book, we found it refreshing, especially for the reasons that Andrea just said, you know, out away from self-help and coaching mentality and everything, and bringing philosophy to our day-to-day -day life in a respectful way. Um, and also, you talk about books, not only philosophy, you talk about books, which is the, the other thing that here in the lab we love. So mm -hmm. philosophy and books, I mean, it's just, it resonates with us. So especially on page 23 of your book, you, you said, and this is a free translation because I don't have an English translation of your book yet. So I, <laughs> I took the liberty to translate it into English. It says, the dissembling of one's library is like becoming an archaeologist of oneself. That's a very strong statement that resonated with us. Something to which we could immediately relate. I mean, everybody, I think that the majority of the people that are here with us can resonate. Can you tell us a little bit more about this archaeology of yourself? Yes, of course. Uh Thank you for all the things that you said. I'm so, I'm so glad to hear them. You know, it's uh, it's such a you know I, I think you know that uh, it's such a solitary activity to write. You know that when you get to meet the people and to greet and to feel that something that you wrote you and you thought uh, has uh, and in some way echoed in their head. Uh, I know it's something like um, I'm so cheerful about it. I cannot help it. And 
anyway, um, this passage that uh, uh, you, Flavia, read uh, was one of the passages that I was writing. Uh, when I, I write, I'm always like uh, going in a flow. No, I'm not thinking when I write. I, I think before, I think afterwards, too much maybe, like rethinking or ruminating. But as I write, I feel very free. Um, and that's why I love writing because it makes me feel free because it's like some other engine in my head uh, was writing. And so I wrote this, uh, this thing about uh, the archeologist thing. And, and then I reread it when I finished writing, uh, like, like when I was writing the draft, I, not, I don't mean after the, the end of the book. I was telling myself, wow, that's so, uh, true. That's so true. Because, uh, you know, I think in some way, we, I'm not the one only one to think it, but uh, I think we change. You know? Every experience, every reading, every day that we live just changes us. And so I imagine myself, but I imagine everybody, and that helps helps me sometimes understand people in, in when they behave in ways that I found you know incomprehensible but also myself uh, I understand myself when I'm acting crazy by thinking that I am like a collection of me's now there's the me of the you know 29th of March and the me of the 30th of March and now there's the me of today and then there will be the me of tomorrow and after tomorrow and all that and so I think that we change in so many ways that we cannot you know nor control nor check nor see or notice because you know it's like when you have a, a kid in your uh, a baby and then a kid in your house and and maybe it grows up a little bit every day but if you have it him or her uh, under your eyes for every day you just don't notice and and then people that haven't seen uh, her or him in a while they say oh it's so big it's, it's so big and then you say oh yeah maybe it's true and i think that goes it's true for our babies, but also for us. So we change in so many ways. And for me, at least, and I think for all the people that uh, really love books, uh, this is not valuable for maybe for those people that have a, a very uh, precise order to keep books, like the ones that are very uh, control freak and put, they take a book and then they put the, uh, back into place. But I don't know so many people that just really, really do it. I think that when you are reading books and when they are working in your mind, in some way they find a way to, you know, to find their own chaos. And I was uh, thinking about my, you know, I'm a very um, chaotic person. I'm not, I'm not a tidy person. I, uh, I don't show you much of my study room here, but uh, if you <laughs> saw it like- No, uh, nobody, no, uh, we are all together in that. Okay. We are not <laughs> moving our cameras. No, no way, no oh, way. Yes, yes. Okay, so uh, um, behind my computer, I have a pile of books on the floor and I don't know, just they're all out. All out of the and there's anarchy in the bookshelves and and this but i was wondering as i was uh, moving all my stuff and i was unpacking my my things to you know just to put them in the in the boxes and to pack them i was seeing that this anarchy in the bookshelves had an order like an inner or unconscious order because there were the books that I had read in some period in my life and the books that I hadn't read in a while and the books that I was always coming to and they all had different positions and I think when you move from a house I mean I'm very um, sympathetic to that because I moved many houses I think, uh, at least in Italy, but maybe also in Brazil, I don't know, but people my generation, people that are 30 now uh, have moved very much because we know uh, we grew up with this idea that we could belong anywhere in Europe. So we went and then there was the crisis and then we came back and then we went away. So it was very, very crazy about that, but uh, 
very you know very free as well our uh, relation to to the house we live in uh, we don't our parents maybe just got married at 25 and went to live in the houses that were they were going to occupy for the rest of their lives we are changing we are more, more a little more nomadic and i think um the way that you arrange your your things in uh, places that are temporary uh, tells uh, a lot about you and so since i and i have a very uh, you know a very strong a very heart uh, heartfelt feeling uh, about the places where i lived and about any time that i tried to arrange my stuff in some way so i was thinking that you know that was like a, some kind of a self portrait uh, but not a self portrait made for vanity but you know, to follow your inner order and the inner order or, you know, who you are, where your interests uh, lead you. And so I had this idea of the archaeologist because I forget uh, why I put things in some way. Uh, and so I was like wondering why did I put all these books here? And then like an archaeologist, I was finding the, the answers. And I think this of the archaeology is um, a very powerful metaphor. It was uh, very much used by Freud uh, to, you know, to mean the psychoanalytic work. And I had studied that and then I forgot it. And then when I wrote it, I, it, I recalled it. And, and so that's why I cherish that page so much because it I think wonderful. And I think that Andrea has a question that, you know, relates to, to that, to yeah. the process. Uh, but for, before the question, we have people from all over Brazil and some other countries as well, Ilaria. There is a gear that uh, uh, I'm going to read this because I, uh, I think it is very beautiful here because she he's saying that please thank Ilaria for her brave, honest and insightful talk listening from lockdown Ireland. Best wishes for your future studies. I really loved what she was telling us. So thank you. Thank you. I'm so, you know, it's so, I'm so emotional about this. We are so far in space and then we are close. I'm so happy. Thank you. You're welcome. And there is a question from Eugenio here that he's asking you, during your experience, how was your intimate transition from one school to another? Was it a literary exercise or an existential exercise? Thank you. That's a very, you know, a very important, a very deep question. Because um, as I was starting to do it, um, I was fearing that it would it would turn into a literary exercise but i didn't want it um and then but i didn't want either to force me into the uh, existential experience because i was feeling you know I, i'm a person that uh, is not very good at faking stuff <laughs> I, i'm a very bad actor and i think um as a writer you know, I always mix uh, fantasy and reality, but there are some core feelings, some deep, deep feelings that I cannot fake. And so I was very interested in how my feel, my way of feeling uh, life would change. So I was telling myself I would waste a little bit this experience if I turn it into a just a stylish experience, you know, like uh, uh, exercise de style. Uh, so um, I was hoping that it would be uh, an existential experience and it turned out to be one. Uh, even though I had some problems, just um, for example, with the Stoic school, uh, I had a problem because uh, I think I'm not really so much leaning towards uh, stoicism. Um, I'm more of a skeptic, uh, Epicurean kind of girl. <laughs> I don't know. That's <laughs> so crazy to say. But anyway, I, 
and you know uh, the the affinity with the schools was very important and i think it feels in the book as well but anyway i tried to uh, go through them go through the schools with the, the most the as much as uh, you know uh, open mind as i could and uh, that way i found out that that was a real uh, existential exercise because after I finished it, there are some things that these schools uh, left me and that I still feel inside myself. And I sometimes come back to them. And the most, the weirdest, I think, was the last school, the cynic school, uh, where I tell that, uh, wait, I have to call him, uh, that I adopted a dog. And you know what? I hadn't when i wrote it i hadn't adopted my dog uh, but i wrote the um, the chapter just trying to imagine how it would have felt and here emilio you can show him yeah oh, we love eat, dogs here yeah it but you know what i all my life i and it's fantasy to have a dog and I had never had one because you know before I was traveling a lot and you know you know moving from one uh, flat to another and and all this stuff and and then my boyfriend didn't want a dog and then I wrote this chapter with the idea that I had convinced him because meanwhile I had an, a new boyfriend which is my boyfriend now <laughs> and then he got convinced about this last chapter chapter and after I finished uh, writing this last chapter we adopted this dog uh, here, Emilio, uh, the, the one you, you saw. And the thing that amazes me is that I had desired so much to have a dog and I had imagined uh, so strongly how it would, how it could, it could feel to go around with a dog that now I go out with him and I walk with him. I feel like you know, amazed at the idea that uh, it is just like I had uh, dreamt of it and uh, just like I had written of it you know, in the book. So that, that's so crazy. And that's like, you know, the, more, the most concrete uh, um, heritage of my book. Uh, the proof that, you know, somehow it changed my, my life in a very, you know, in a very tangible way. We would uh, we would like you to to finish when we finish when we get there, with with that with, with um, your with the things you could tell us about the pleasures you recovered as you said or rediscovered refound. I don't know how to translate that into English. Uh, in Portuguese, is prazer recuperado por meio da filosofia. So let's let's put a pin on that so you can talk about that later. Um, now, I would like to ask, if I may, uh, a specific question about philosophy. Um, your book begins with a quote from the Temple of Apollo in Delphi. Conhece-te a ti mesmo in, in Portuguese. <laughs> and in the chapter describing this, sto this stoic week of your experience, you mention, oh, I don't know how to pronounce this, and Shiridion by Epictetus, and cited Epictetus' exhortation that those who wish to become true Stoics should at least want to be like Socrates. So like Epictetus, do you consider Socrates as the role model for all philosophers and thinkers? That's a very good, good question. Um, um, Yes, I think I have. Uh, I think I really have a, a thing about uh, Socrates. Uh, I absolutely, <laughs> I'm absolutely in love with this uh, character. Uh, you know, here in Italy, I'm doing. Um, sometimes I'm doing. Uh, just I started uh, a, a few months ago to uh, participate in a TV program for kids. 
like on the national television there's a program for kids in the afternoon because in this year they're not going to school they're like uh, doing uh, school from a distance and so they they do this uh, this program uh, which is like uh, people that explain uh, some some stuff to to children and i get some philosophy lectures and I did one about Socrates and I was so moved because afterwards the kids uh, some I, I got some messages from the kids that were saying but I like this guy and I was so moved because I think it, he's a very very powerful figure um, also in, in a spiritual not in a religious way, but in a very spiritual way. Um, there are some parallels between uh, uh, the Christ's death and uh, uh, Socrates' death. The idea of, you know, uh, just letting people that that are that didn't understand them kill them, and that's very very powerful. And I think. Uh, it move uh, it moves me uh, to any time I read the the last pages uh, of the uh, I don't know in uh, English the Phaedon from uh, from Plato Phaedon Phaedon <laughs> yeah I think um, uh, where uh, the um, the death of Socrates is told and I think there lies something very deep and that goes to the very much to the heart of uh, philosophy and what i was thinking is that uh, you know the the story the famous story about thales that is uh, falling into the well no and and the girl from uh, uh, the Thracian girl uh, which uh, who sees him uh, laughs at him and he falls into the well and it's like upside down it's very very funny and that's the philosopher that looks at the sky but doesn't know where he puts his his feet um that story is told uh, by plato the teteto uh, there too i don't know the english name i'm so sorry uh, but uh, you know in a dialogue where he makes socrates tell this tell the, that story and uh, of course, he wrote that dialogue uh, just after Socrates' death. So uh, the idea of this pupil that was, you know, remembering the, the teachings of his teacher who was killed, but by the, not the ignorance, but the willing not to understand him of his uh, citizen that were like in some way uh, frightened by this way of asking questions of this uh, freedom of thought and stuff. I think that is something very, very moving because it gives you the idea of, uh, of the extent to which philosophy is an exercise of freedom. Uh, I've always loved philosophers that lived philosophy as an exercise of freedom. That's why I studied Spinoza in my early years and with because he was another one. Huh? And that's why I loved uh, Socrates and Epicure so much. And while I was writing my book, there were like these big figures. I, I was feeling like they were in some way present to my everyday life. And so I think uh, there's something uh, at an ethics, an ethic level that, uh, you know, uh, bring Socrates as a model because uh, in the end of the uh, Phaedon, he says, you know, he goes on to his death, just, you know, facing it with this braveness, which is not the braveness of, you know, a temerary man. It's not the braveness of a soldier. It's the braveness of a philosopher, of someone who has is bearing in mind this idea of truth and uh, of how a dignified man should uh, you know behave and that reminds me of all the martyrs of the freedom of, uh, of thinking and which is something that you know moves me very very much so this there's this uh, ethical uh, 
thing. And there's also the theoretical thing. Uh, so the idea of questioning everything, the idea of the dialectics, the idea of the maiotics, the idea of putting people in the conditions to find their own path to, to truth. And that's well, I think is the real vocation of philosophy. And I think also that's why it is should be good uh, that in this world uh, it is more and more uh, frightened of complexity and of th thought and of freedom in in all this way and of the you know of the uh, of the raison uh, in the meaning of the um, of the age of the lightnings uh, i think it should be um, a good thing that kids in school start learning philosophy because they are that Definitely. Definitely. you know so we need more socrates yeah. <laughs> we all as a I as a society think, i think so uh, i think so and i'm so moved by his figure and that's so powerful and when i was uh, when i was doing this uh, uh, tv thing about socrates i was so moved by the messages of the kids because you know it, it means that it, it can you know communicate this figure from uh, 2050 and 500 years ago and it can communicate to kids from nowadays that's so powerful wonderful um we also um got got that on your account on the epicurean week you went away from the popular um, understanding and you brought the concepts of temperance and moderation is very good um i'm sorry we won't have time to talk about that because it's already 18. oh sorry because i i, I think o'clock so <laughs> here <laughs> but i'm sure i mean we are delighted we could hear you forever no, I'm but so sorry. I'm, I'm, i must as I said, th that topic that I asked you to put a pin on it before, um, and I'm quoting from your book, page 199 on the Brazilian um, version is, you said, infinite are the things that I don't have as infinite are the ones that I don't know. However, since I lost my old certainties and learned to subject myself to the canon of the old schools, I have, and then I don't know which is the best word in English to translate your idea, refound, rediscovered, a, a pleasure or thrill lost for a long time. I think that if you could finish elaborating on these messages and the, on the, the pleasures regained through philosophy, you would amaze us. Yes. I Thank you, um, and I'm so sorry to have been talked too much. Uh, I have this, you know, I'm not at all, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> this flow, but um, anyway, uh, that was uh, one page that uh, I, I was very inspired when I wrote that page as well, because I was imagining myself with my future dog, <laughs> which I didn't know it would come so so quickly afterwards but anyway um that is um you know a, a free quotation from socrates as well the idea that uh, you know you you can just know of not knowing that that is very very famous no? the uh, philosophical ignorance the idea uh, I was paralyzed when I was at university. I was in this very competitive school what, where everybody was like very, very proud of what they knew or what they were studying. And I was feeling so insecure. Uh, I was feeling so lost because I didn't know stuff and I knew I didn't know. And so that was also mm, something that uh, I mean, like a joke, you know, I know, I don't know. I just go to the exam and say, no, I, I don't, I, you know, I just know I not, of not knowing anything. I never did it at the exam, spirit, but I, I fantasized about doing that. And anyway, I think it's very powerful. The idea of letting go, letting go the things that you have to, you know, to, uh, to gain and to keep 
and that was uh, my freedom after I wrote this book and now I, I just finished writing a new book in Italian and what's funny is that I hadn't think, uh, thought about that, but the, the end of the new book, uh, it, it, it looks a little bit like this, it sounds a little bit like this, even though it's different. And it's the idea of letting go. It's the idea that, you know, the most important thing is the search for something. It's not the keeping of something. And that's an idea from Socrates. Uh, he said, uh, a life without search is not worth be living. Um, you know, I think that is so true. If I think, the more I think about it, the more I think it is true. That uh, it's not important what you keep, it's not important what you have, it's not important what you know. What is important is what is where the questions you ask yourself uh, will lead you. And I think we should never forget that, uh, even though it is very, very easy to forget that. And that's why I, I chose to uh, use as the last school of my book, the cynical school, which is uh, a school, a very radical Socratic school, because they take some of the teachings of Socrates, uh, well, uh, um, Diogenes, the, the chief of the school, uh, was like, uh, his uh, nickname was uh, Drunken Socrates. He was like a little bit uh, crazy, uh, a punk in some way. And he was questioning people. He was like harassing people in the street about their needs and what they were doing and why they were doing stuff. And I think this radical question about you know conventions about respecting rules that are somehow unwritten rules that are imposed by society is something so precious uh, nowadays and i think i would need to do it much more than i do uh, because i think these pandemics has set some kind of you know some way of conform oneself because we have more important stuff to, to do. I, I'm not saying that we should go around without masks. It's not something that's superficial. It's something about you know the time that you uh, work in one day, the, uh, the number of hours, the rights uh, about working, uh, wh why you're doing that. You is Mia, of course. Uh, but you know, just asking oneself why we do the thing, why we do put efforts. In, in things as we do. And I think that is very, very deep and very important and very easy to lose uh, because, you know, it's so, it's so easy, it's so obvious to follow, to follow the flow and, you know, having the courage to ask themselves why and to which extent I can pull this and what can I do for others and what can I do for myself to you know to be to get real is very important and so I was I was meaning that because to write this book I refused to to write other books that you know I didn't care about and when I went to the end I was a little bit moved you know to have done all this path to you know this experimental way to you know to put myself at proof and stuff and so I was you know, saying, okay, I, maybe I lost anything, but, you know, at least I researched something. And that is something I want to keep in mind uh, for all my work. And I hope to, you know, to, to keep up to it. And I think it's something valuable for, uh, not only for myself, but, you know, a little bit for everyone, because it, it is safe, it is, uh, it is uh, healthy to ask oneself, why? Why do I do this? Why do I have to do this? Because I think we are so under so, so much pressure and sometimes we lose uh, the, the reason why, uh, why we do it. So that's it for me. Ilaria, thank you. Thank you so much for being here with us. It's more than 11 o'clock. It's time to, to relax there in Italy. <laughs> And we would like to thank you so much. You are always invited to come here to talk to us. And maybe we are looking forward to the vaccination 
and then you can come to Brazil and meet us in person. I'd love to. I'm so sorry I took too much, but you know, I'm very interested. Don't be sorry. Don't be sorry. We are here to listen to you. <laughs> away. So sorry. We can have we can have a second round. We can organize a second round. When you Don't want. worry, because many people are reading your book. So maybe we have a we organize a QA in a couple of months. Maybe it's an idea. Ah, oh, that would be a pleasure. Yes, yes, of great course. idea. Yes, good, 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 good. That's good. So I don't feel guilty. <laughs> yes, yes. As you as you can see, our books are like that. Oh, here. that moves me. No, that really yeah. moves me. Yeah. So thank you so much. Muito, muito obrigada a todos que estiveram aqui com a gente. Uh, voltaremos então. Aguardem aí o que, que vem por aí. Flavinha, obrigada. Viu? Muito, muito, muito obrigada. Eu que agradeço a honra de estar aqui. E, Hilaria, we are waiting for your, your next book, ok? Yes, uh, I hope it, it will be translated, but I love it to be. And anyway, really, if we want to do a uh, Q&A in a few months, that would be perfect we, for me. We are, we are. <laughs> pleasure to meet you and thank you thank you so much for your insightful questions for everything so this is the homework for everybody that is here or that has been here or that will be going uh, will watch it later because it's going to be on our facebook page and our on our on our website as well uh, because people can read your book, ask the question, so everybody's going to have homework, a very nice homework, and then we'll meet again. Thank you so much. Bye bye, everybody. Thank you. Muito obrigada. <laughs> nice. <laughs>